in case you were counting, that's 11 times the word world is used in this passage. It's a key. It's a huge key. And you might remember last week uh, I shared with you that John uses the word in Greek cosmos in two different ways, completely different. One, in the beauty of all of you and every human being and all of creation, that's a good world. But he also uses, as does the epistle writer, John, the world as all that mitigates against God, all that is evil, all that is violent, all that is sinful, all that degrades. And that's the way it's used here 11 times. So there's a huge contrast. Okay, grace to you and peace through Christ, who prays for us who are still in the world and who prays for our unity, our oneness in Christ, who grants us eternal life already, the life of the world to come, sneaking back into the world and into your hearts right now. That's what he means by that. And then sends us out into the world. And it's there meant the negative sense of that, the evil sense. We're sent into whatever happens in our lives that is evil. We're sent into it to do something about it, see? There are many ways to unite people. Let's think of them. You can unite, as my mother often did, with other Norwegians because they were the best race in the world, apparently. And we united over Ludafisk and Krumkaka, and it's okay to be united up to a point. Uh, we can be united by tribe, country of origin, political views, be careful here. Uh, but it's unifying, is it not? It unifies at least one group against another group, doesn't it? Ethnic foods, I love that one. I think that's a good one to be unified about, especially spicy. Uh, skin color, be careful. Family unites us, be careful. <laughs> Not just, you're, you're laughing because there's some humorous things that are happening on Mother's Day with that, that uncle that's going to be at the dinner and so forth, I know. But family is good and right and salutary. I love my family. Jesus warns us not to go too far with that. Uh, and then, of course, we are united. You can unite people with hate groups. Uh, in 2022, the last data we have on hate groups in the United States, do you think there's more than 100? Do you think there's more than 800? What? More than 800? Yes. There's 1,222 hate groups across the United States. And it's been growing ever since I've been following this. Back in uh, uh, 1998, I started following this, the statistics on hate groups. Now, that's sobering. But it surely unites people, doesn't it? In a terrible way, in a rotten way, in an evil way. It is the way of the what? World. That's the way John is using world, see? Very, very hateful stuff. It mitigates against God. And that's how he's using that. Jesus was going home to his father. Um, he was going to his place of origin, um, where he had come from. That's an interesting and provocative phrase. I'm going to where I came from, isn't it? It belongs in a Bible study. But it's very interesting for us to think about this. He was going to leave them. Sort of, because he didn't completely leave them or us, did he? But he was his physical, they weren't going to see his face anymore. This is before the ascension. Um, and he gave them instructions about going into the world and being unified. But unified in the right way, in the good way. In that way of love, unconditional love. That's how we are to be unified. So he called them together once more, and he, and this is just a little theory of mine. I think he wondered as he physically goes away from them, not completely, but physically. I wonder if he wondered, would the spirit that he was giving them really unify them? Or would they become divided? As we saw the church last week, 
at about 100 uh, AD, they were already splintering and dividing because certain people in the church had heirs. They, and I mean A-I-R-S, they had this. We're better than you because we're smarter. It's all about Gnosticism. You know, I know something you don't know about God. I have an inside track and you don't. And the church began to split, see? So Jesus is saying, I pray to the Father for you today that you may remain unified in unconditional love and not be divided. You know, would they have the courage, I think he was wondering, in my little pet theory, uh, and why he prayed this. Would they have the courage to go into the world and, yes, stand up against the world, against tyranny, against violence, against killing children as you know, a way of bringing peace? Would they have the courage that he promised he'd give them? Uh, would they remember that the powers that hated him would hate them? And I thank the Bible study and Pastor Kim for the marvelous notes that he gave me, which helped frame this sermon this morning. By the way, as a little miniature example, I love this guy. I think the world of him. I respect him. We work together well. We are unified. Well, except he doesn't like his, quite as much hot sauce as I do. But outside of that, <laughs> well, he does. But, you know, he doesn't go over the top. But you know, we'll work on that. But I really feel unified in ministry with this man. And I publicly say that. I, I really respect him. Um, so he prayed, don't be like the world. Be like me. I am the incarnation of the Father, of God. Uh, God, and I love back in seminary, we read some marvelous theologians. Uh, one of them was Taylor de Chardon. I got to read him. I followed him for about the first 10 years of uh, being ordained, and then I got too busy. So I'm picking him up again. He wrote this. He was a Jesuit priest and a scientist in France who wrote amazingly profound treaties on God as love. He wrote this. Love is the most mysterious, universal, and awesome of all cosmic energies, and it is what God is. It's good to read some scientists once in a while. You know, it helps us. Um, faith and science are not, uh, you know, mutually ex uh, different. They share something in common, especially when it comes to faith. There, is a, there was a remarkable person that he's in our Lutheran calendar of saints, August 14th, along with Maximilian Kolbe, as a martyr in the Lutheran calendar. His name is Kai Munk. He was Danish. And he was a Lutheran pastor and a playwright. And Kai Munk learned what Jesus is talking about in the text today, uh, in a very down-to-earth existential way because this was during Hitler's reign of Europe. And, of course, the, Hitler did unconscionable evil. But there was a time, and Kai Monk regretted this because he, he wrote articles for the paper in Denmark. He wrote something that kind of gave the idea that he liked Adolf Hitler. He actually did. He was a Lutheran pastor and a playwright. And what he liked about it, and he didn't clearly say it, was that Hitler unified what Germany it was taken out of context he publicly apologized for it and he began that moment to speak very directly against the world of evil and killing and violence and bloodshed and imperialism and the Gestapo warned him many times to shut up Quit writing. We're checking every play that you write. We're checking every sermon that you write. And I wonder if anybody knows what Kai Monk did. He kept writing. He kept talking, knowing that as Jesus says in the text today, the world not only hates me, the evil, all that stuff that mitigates against God, but they will hate you. And he accepted it. And uh, the first Sunday in Advent in 1944, he was invited to preach in the Copenhagen Cathedral. It had been Catholic. It was kind of moving toward Lutheran at this time. And uh, he preached 
a sermon that very clearly uh, called out Hitler, called out evil, called out all the violence and rotten stuff that was happening in Germany. And he wrote a letter to Mussolini and to Hitler, and he publicly castigated their actions. Knowing what might happen, exactly a month later, he and his daughter were in the study room, and so was his wife, and a knock came to the door. And he kind of knew, but he never let on to them, and he said, <clears throat> I'm going to be gone for a little while. I hope to be back. They took him in the car. They pulled him out of the car. They shot him a number of times and rolled his body into a ditch with a little note that said, and yet you serve Germany, you swine. And here's what he wrote in his sermon. And that's what I'm getting to in this little drawing that I hope you can, that I hope looks like the animals I was trying to draw. Um, what is our task today? He's preaching in the cathedral. Uh, our task today is to rage against evil. For what we Christians lack is not psychology or literature. We lack a holy rage, which comes from Christ and the knowledge of God. The ability to rage when justice lies prostrate on the streets and when the lie rages across our country, Hitler had used Denmark as a kind of a buffer zone as he was going north into the Scandinavian countries. And when uh, a holy anger that the things that are wrong in the world should be talked about publicly. To rage against the ravagings of God's earth and the destruction of God's world. To rage when little children are outright murdered or must die of hunger when the tables of the rich are sagging with food. Do you think he was kind of brave and clear? To rage at the senseless, senseless killing of so many and against the madness of militaries. Uh, he's not pulling any punches here, is he? To rage at the lie. I love this. The lie that calls the threat of death and the strategy of destruction peace. What a lie. Have we heard that in today's world? Yes. To rage against complacency, to restlessly seek to change human history until it conforms to the norms of Christ and the kingdom of God. And remember, and here it is, folks, the signs of the Christian church have been the lion, the lamb, the dove, the fish, but never the chameleon. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.